Hello again. Jacques Ellul, The Subversion of Christianity. His first chapter, The Chief Forms. And we're talking here about the forms of perversion that Ellul sees in Christian history. But if the perversion is not Christian doctrine, and that because, by the way, the Church has wrestled with doctrine and dogmatic issues, including God, who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is, they wrestled with that for three centuries already, so there had been a lot of success in working out and getting a consensus on doctrinal issues, including the nature of salvation. But they hadn't wrestled with the relation of the church to the state, and now suddenly they were forced by the conversion of Constantine suddenly to deal with this. And of course, because it hadn't been thought through and there had been no consensus reached, mistakes were made, serious mistakes. A little goes on. In other words, once the transition was made from history to philosophy, that being the adaptation of Christianity to Greek forms and Greek language that had already happened by 300 AD, before the Roman Empire was Christianized. In other words, once the transition was made from history to philosophy, all that they said was completely correct and true. So you see, Alola is endorsing their doctrinal stances for the most part. He says, though, they expressed a profound and authentic faith marked by a concern for truth. Yet it was all completely falsified by the initial transition. This is why the deviations were stronger than the truth that they retained. Very soon they forgot the essential point, that God does not reveal by means of a philosophical system, or a moral code, or a metaphysical construction. He enters human history and accompanies his people. The Hebrew Bible, even in the wisdom books, is not a philosophical construction or a system of knowledge. It is a series of stories that are not myths intended to veil and unveil objective and abstract truths. These stories are one history, the history of the people of God, the history of God's agreements and disagreements with this people, the history of loyalty and disobedience. There is nothing else but history, temporal, not eternal history, lay, not sacred history, a history that tells us that God is with us and for us, but that does not speak about God in himself or provide any theory about God. Like all human histories, the Bible is a book that is full of questions, but never gives any answers. Now, some Protestants for sure are going to pick a fight with that one. Or rather, the answer too is included in the history and has to do with us. The, even the parts of the Hebrew Bible that seem more disembodied, such as the law, the statutes, and the legal formulation, still belong to the history. The law is never eternal or absolute. It is always bound to a given history. This book offers us eternal laws expressing the will of God, yet laws that are always historical. There is a central truth which consists of the words, such as the Ten Commandments, but these are not true in themselves like objective and neutral scientific laws. No matter who teaches them, the scientific laws remain the same because they are external and can be passed on like a parcel to those who listen. Biblical law, however, is true only because it is God who speaks it. It draws its truth from God. If we detach it from the speaker, it is no more than a subject for discussion with some acceptable elements. This is why this law does not fall from heaven like the golden plates of the celebrated Joseph Smith, Mormonism that is. It is given in the course of an election and liberation as the attestation of a covenant. It cannot be separated from this series of events. The law is the point of the covenant and the starting point of a new history. It is never a sort of frozen code abstracted from existence. One can never make of it a legal system apart from the living, moving, and actual presence of him who calls himself the living God. But life can never be made into scientific doctrine and knowledge. This aspect continues and gains emphasis with Jesus. To do his work, God does not send a book of metaphysics or a sacred book of Gnostic revelations or a complete epistemological system or a perfected wisdom. He sends a man. In relation to him, stories are told again that constitute a history. Even those who, like Paul and James, are more theoreticians than historians, carefully preserve the historical element as the touchstone of authenticity. 
all that they write has to do exclusively with the history of Jesus and of those whom he summons to faith. The greatest theologian, John, in his Gospel, as well as in his Epistles and Revelation, always expresses his theology as a history. In this regard, the last book, and I take it he means by this revelation, refers to a history that is not the truth, and I don't believe he means truth absolutely, he means truth his historically. That is, revelation doesn't, is not prophecy, and it's certainly not mostly history, but it's the possible, the only possible framework in which to understand and express the will of God. So the form of apocalyptic, as Alul understands it, has that application. It's eternal, even though it's presented in, because it's presented in the way of pictures. This is the mode that God has chosen to reveal himself to us, but we seize it all and completely change the framework so as to bring in our own system of questions and expressions. So the Bible, as I love sees it, is not a, a code of law. It's not even a religion. It's not a religious book. It's a history book, essentially, and it's about a relationship that God has with us and, and we with him. I can't help but be reminded of Paul's point in one of his last epistles, Colossians, where he says that the hope of Christians is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Again, the human element. Christ is not only incarnate in Messiah, but he is in us, the hope of glory, Colossians chapter 1. So I'm putting a link in to how Vivian and I found doctrine, that is the doctrine of grace and salvation, through reading the historical books of the Bible, specifically the book of Genesis, how God revealed himself in the history of the patriarchs in his character, the truest elements of his character. So in the next segment we'll talk about the subversion of Christianity by power, the scandal of a perverting and persecuting church. A perversion as Alol sees it being that they turned into the thing that had persecuted them. We all know it, but we don't necessarily think of it as a scandal that prevents not only us from achieving kingdom unity, but it prevents the world from seeing the difference between the kingdom of Christ and the kingdoms of the world. So the next segment, the subversion of Christianity by power.